This is Walter Huntley reporting for the National Newswire. Behind these fences and tumbleweeds, people worked in secret on the atom bomb that ended the war. The Atomic Energy Commission has since recast the research done at these Manhattan Project sites. Now they're called National Laboratories. But what do they really do there? We hear only rumors of their secretive work, as civilians are not permitted to... Oh, we've been spotted by the patrol. Walter Huntley signing off. Yikes. No wonder with a biography like that spanning several decades. For some people, the National Labs conjure up images of World War II, the Cold War, secrecy, isolation. If only they knew that that wasn't true today. Today, the U.S. Department of Energy operates 17 National Labs. Over the years, these labs have evolved to become so much more. But one thing still remains true. They still attract the world's top talent, to do some of the most exciting and important science and engineering on the planet. Well, best way to find out is if we pull back the curtain on one of the national labs, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Come along. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hodes. I'm a biochemist by training who now is a commercialization manager here at PNNL. So my job here is to take our different technologies and research and help make the world a better place by deploying it to different companies, partners, and even research institutions. Here we are on our Richland, Washington campus. This is the largest set of our organization with about 4,000 people. How about I take you on a quick tour around our campus so you can take a look and see what we do. Hey Dave, make sure you get a good charge. Hey, Jason. Oh, hey, Jen. So these huge screens, what's going on on all of them? Uh, this is related to our grid research here at PNNL. We do a lot of work in, all the way from distribution, transmission, generation, cybersecurity, wide variety of things to really look at the future of the power grid. We have a lot of agreements with our utility partners that allow us to bring in their data and do things like visual analytics and things like that that uh, help us understand what that future power grid should look like. Wow, OK. So on a separate note, this would be awesome for watching the Super Bowl. So how would I reserve it? Uh, well, you have to be a Seahawks fan. Okay, thanks Jason. See you, Jen. Hey Phil, how was the kayak into work today? It was beautiful, the river was like glass. Awesome. Take care. Bye. Are you guys authorized to be on ah. our network? Uh, yeah, so I'm Dan. I'm a cybersecurity researcher here, and this is Lisa. Uh, it was kind of nice that you were suspicious of people connecting to your network. Uh, cybersecurity is something we should all be vigilant about. So what is it that you do here? Well, currently I'm taking network data and host-based data and building out models, and those models to help generate uh, threat indicators. What I'm doing right now is validating those threat indicators with Lisa. Um, she's part of our unclassified cybersecurity staff and so we are trying to take this approach and validate it such that we can transition it to an operational component in a complex network um, to help protect against the next level or next generation of adversaries. Because cybersecurity is constantly evolving, you have to constantly research new techniques to try and find those threat indicators. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that I have you guys in our corner and um, I'll, I won't surprise you next time with flipping on the lights. I won't be so suspicious. Right. It's nice meeting you. Nice to meet you too. Hey, the lights! Here we are on the campus of Washington State University Tri-Cities where we collaborate on bioenergy research. Why don't we go take a look? Hi, Marifel. Hi, Jeff. Oh, so we're going to use that to make some espresso. So where's the espresso come out from? This is that coffee bean. This is actually a catalyst. And we use this equipment to make catalysts using catalyst recipes. Oh, OK. So to do what? What do the catalysts do? Have you heard about straw being turned into gold? Sure. My research is actually on converting biomass into valuable products. 
and okay. we use those catalysts in that process. So can you describe the process a bit? Sure. We use biomass such as pine, grape byproducts, and algae. So these are converted using our catalysts into bio-oils or bio-crudes in just minutes. After refining, we then have this product that is a fuel. So you're basically like a really high-tech barista. I'm a chemical engineer, but I guess same thing. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thanks so much. Sure. Aisha, tuning up the instrument? Yeah. Oh, so I believe you told me that this is used to understand and predict how the atmosphere affects the climate? That's right, Jen. We use these to monitor snowpack levels and drought conditions. These instruments measure properties in the atmosphere, like solar energy, cloud properties, and precipitation interactions. We even have an airplane that takes atmospheric measurements while flying around tropical storms and smog. So what do you do with those measurements? Well, we use these measurements to develop some of the world's most sophisticated climate models so that others can use these results to make more informed decisions about things like water resources, agriculture, and protecting the coastal communities from flooding. Wow, okay, well, I'll leave you to it. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I bet that's Nicole from the Seattle office. Hi, Nicole. How are things in the Emerald City? Oh, hey, Jen. It's a great day here in Seattle. See for yourself. We can see the Lake Union. And we can even see the Space Needle. We really like working here. We've got a great working environment with lots of people from different backgrounds, scientists and engineers, all working together on problems of national security. We can partner with a lot of people from the University of Washington, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, it helps build our innovation. Hey, Nicole, I gotta go. It looks like I'm getting a call from our Marine Science Laboratory in Squim. Hey, Jen. I just wanted to update you on our native seagrass called eelgrass. This is eelgrass right here. It stores carbon on shorelines all around the world and is habitat for salmon and crab. It's been dying back in areas that are populated and developed, which is a concern, so we grow it here. We're the Department of Energy's only coastal laboratory located near the Pacific Ocean, and our native eel grass bed and salt marsh allow us to research the effects of climate conditions. Check out this view. Out on the spit is where the salt marsh and eel grass bed grow, and across the strait you can see Canada in the distance and the Cascade Mountains, and these are some of our eel grass tanks on the dock. The more we can understand the environmental conditions affecting eelgrass, the better we can protect and restore the nation's coastal ecosystems. Well, gotta go now, Jen. See you next time I'm up on the Columbia. Well, there you have it, a snapshot of our life at PNNL. Well, of course we don't tackle the nation's most challenging problems all alone. We do this with different companies, universities, and different research organizations all around the world. So if you're interested in learning more about PNNL or how to collaborate with us, intern, or even apply for a job, check out pnnl.gov. The days of the Manhattan Project are where they belong, behind us. But our spirit of innovation and tackling the nation's greatest challenges lives on.